Now, reports of violence in Saudi Arabia, rising food and energy prices around the world, and the uncertain jobs picture here in the United States. Well, they all could have an effect on the economic recovery. Let's discuss some of those issues with my guest, Joe McAlinden, fund manager at Catalpa Capital. He's the former chief investment officer of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. He's also a Bloomberg, uh, well, we, can we call you a Bloomberg best almost, I think, maybe because almost you've got best. a V. You've got a V-shaped, you've got a V-shaped recovery going. Also with us, we have Bloomberg Business Week's Peter H. Coy. Peter, good to have you with us. Thank we you. brought you in because you wrote an opening remarks section in Bloomberg Business Week about Saudi Aramco. Right. And I want to understand the connection between what is going on in Saudi Arabia in terms of potential protests. We got the reports that there were shots being fired yes. today. Saudi Arabia is like the only place where there's a lot of reserve capacity for pumping oil out of the ground, right? Right. Saudi Aramco has been keeping a lid on oil prices by offering to produce more. and They have ramped up production. They're the only company, really the only country in the world that has significant spare capacity. They've started to use it. Now you have what happened today in Al-Khatif. This is a city in eastern Saudi Arabia, the eastern province, which is right in the heart of Saudi Arabia's oil fields, and it is majority Shiite. Of course, Saudi Arabia is mostly a Sunni country. The, the Shiites being the ones who are the same as Iran across the Persian Gulf. This starts to create very iffy, iffy situation. Tomorrow was supposed to be the day of rage in Saudi Arabia, but the Shiites, you know, didn't get the message. They started protesting they started today. today. And th what, what's so worrisome is that gunshots were fired. We don't have reports of people being killed, but maybe some injuries occurred, some percussion bombs were sent off. The Saudis are taking this very seriously. They're trying to squelch it right now. The question is, can they keep a lid on this, or is the resentment too great? Joe McAlinden, do investors worry about this kind of stuff overnight? Is this what's going to unhinge the market? They, they, they sure do. I mean, you know, this whole uh, problem through the Maghreb in the Middle East has uh, been what's driven up oil prices. High oil prices, high gasoline prices have gotten everyone spooked. And uh, it's contributed to this correction that's begun in the market, which, as painful as it feels, however, is quite minimal at this point. It's uh, less than 4% down from the peak. And uh, Peter Coy, in this week's edition, there is more, to, there you go, hold it up. Jungle Justice is, is the cover. That's the cover. But inside the right. magazine is a story about what? The autocratic gene. Exactly right. And it's a piece by Romesh Ratnasar talks about nepotism and how harmful that has been to economic development in the Middle East, which has led to the anger that people have, the feeling that they're shut out, that there's no, that there's a, a ceiling. They can only get so far. And, you know, he uses, the, the writer did a great job of quoting from the WikiLeaks cables from the ambassador of the U.S. to Tunisia. Crazy stories about two nephews of the, uh, the, the uh, discredited autocrat who stole a yacht from France brought it back to Tunis, tried to repaint it to hide the crime. Eventually, the yacht was taken back to France and the two nephews were never punished. This is the crazy kind of stuff that just makes people's blood boil and, and probably contributed to the overthrow of that leader in Tunisia. Same thing in Libya, Egypt. And, of course, Saudi Arabia, they don't even call it nepotism. It's a kingdom. It's well, and it's named after the family. Oh, well, yeah. But if... If it's hereditary, then it's actually written into the whole notion of the nation that it'll be passed from father to, to son to brother to brother. So, I mean, you're either in the royal family or you're not. You don't choose. Joe McAlinden, I, I want to bring you in on the conversation uh, uh, just for this very point, because, you know, we often talk about investing in emerging markets, yeah. frontier markets. Is this one of these sort of unspoken qualities, at least of the U.S. and the developed market, is that you at least know when you've got a bum investment because you can kind of see through the details, you know who's in charge, and there's some recourse in the legal system, however lengthy and unfair it might be. But does that then mean that there's a certain premium that should be baked into whenever you make an investment decision? I think there should. And people forget, you know, that, that our market is a market that's very developed. It's hundreds of years old. It's in the greatest democracy in the world with a, with a strong system of laws, a tradition of private property rights. And 
in these countries that we're talking about today and much of the rest of the emerging world are still structured socially like Europe was in the Middle Ages with a ruling elite that just goes on century after century after century. But it was, I think, the invention of the printing press that started a process of a series of revolutions that got us to where we are in the West. It's the internet, I think, that's doing it at warp speed in these emerging countries, in particular in the Middle East. But bringing it right back to the moment and, and investment strategy, I think the trade, uh, which I've, I've said to you before in the last few months, I think it's more true than ever. The trade is you want to be long the U.S., where we have all these good things, and the, our central bank has the foot on the accelerator hard, and you want to be very cautious everywhere else, including Europe and the Far East and North Africa. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the concept of the printing press, but I'm going to turn it and not look at Gutenberg's Bible. <laughs> I want to know about the printing press in Washington, D.C., and what happens in your mind when the Federal Reserve if indeed it does, says, you know what, we're not going to be buying treasuries in the same quantity, even though, as you described, Ben Bernanke does have his foot on the gas and he wants the job market to recover, he wants the economy to grow. What happens when the Federal Reserve stops buying? Well, you know, it's kind of what happens when you, you pour lots of kerosene or, or uh, lighter fluid on, a, on the charcoal and you finally get it lit. I'm, I'm told you don't do that while the match is in no, your hand. No, that's not a good idea. Right. But, but the, once the fire starts, it keeps going. And so I think the economy actually is going to be fine when they stop QE2. The markets are another issue, I think, that long-term interest rates are going to start backing up. The yield curve is going to steepen because of it. Uh, because I think the economy will be strong, inflation expectations will be rising, so the longer end will start rising. And when you mean the, the steepness of the yield curve, just, just explain what that means. That means well, loaning your money to the government for, let's say, 30 years will give you a certain rate, a higher yield than right. loaning it to, let's say, three months. Right. And, and that's, that difference is, I believe, going to widen because I think even though they stop QE2, that they're going to not start raising interest rates right away until maybe late in the second half of the year or maybe early 2012. It's when they actually start the hiking of interest rates, when they start that process, that's when I'll be more worried about the market. These other things that have come along, like this cluster of negative news today, the problems in, in, in North Africa and so forth, will we'll pass. The, the, remember the big correction we had last summer, double dip, the Greek credit, et cetera? These things pass in the early stages of a bull market, which even though we're two years into it, I think we're still in a fairly early stage of this bull market. This is going to go on for a long time. What kind of stocks do you still like? Do you like consumer discretionary? Do you like industrial, energy, technology? I like, believe it or not, uh, these are two groups that are normally not, not correlated, but I like both financials and energy for 2011. For, Why do you like for, financials? Partly the yield curve story. I mean, uh, basically, it enables financial institutions to borrow uh, at low rates and lend at higher rates. Uh, and the volumes are picking up. So commercial and industrial loans have uh, turned from deep negative territory. The short-term uh, growth rate has turned positive. And companies are going to be borrowing more money as we now move into the capital spending phase of this business cycle uh, recovery. And uh, last question for you, Peter Coy. You know, I know that you spent a lot of time thinking about politics, too. You think the Fed's going to raise rates before the 2012 election? It's so far away, it's really hard to say. But they are on hold for now. Anybody who's looking for something, uh, you know, this summer or something, I think that's way premature given the continued weakness of the economy. I want to thank you very much. Peter Coy, Bloomberg Business Week. Joe McElinden, as always, a pleasure from Catalpa Capital.